I still look sweaty. Hello and welcome to the Freakish Lemon video podcast thing. I am the Freakish Lemon, I go by Adrian, and I use male pronouns. Welcome if you're a new viewer, and welcome back if uh, you're a returning viewer. Uh, if you hear a low humming noise under the sound of this video, it is because I have a box fan sitting on a table right in front of my face in order to record this video so that I'm not dripping by the end of it. It is August, and it is hot, and it is humid, as August tends to be, even here in the hills of Connecticut. Um, I didn't finish the introduction stuff. Oh my god, I'm so good at this podcast thing. Okay, so, bleh. Show notes for this episode will be over at freakishlemon.com. You can join the Ravelry group. It's the Freakish Lemon podcast video, video, no, vid, Freakish Lemon video podcast group on Ravelry. Uh, and you can find me as Freakish Lemon on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, places, Ravelry, all the places. It's Freakish Lemon. And the links to all those things will be in the down bar here on YouTube. So, August. Hot, humid, it's gross. Um, Although it hasn't been terrible the past couple of weeks. I mean, it, there have been hot days, but it's been fairly mild for August thus far. But of course, this weekend is when it has to get hot. Um, that's just the way things go. Um, what have I done since my last episode? That's exciting. Uh, I went down to Pennsylvania for a weekend. I took a long weekend and went down and visited some friends, um, drove down Friday, we went to the Renaissance Fair on Saturday, because we're Renaissance Fair people, and then they both had work on Sunday, so I waited until they both went to work, and I drove back up to Connecticut, um, not in my car, because uh, my car is a problem, I borrowed my dad's car, um, more on car stories later. But I actually made some pretty good time. The traffic wasn't terrible. Made it in about six hours, which... Because they live um, pretty close to the Maryland border in southern Pennsylvania, so you go across a lot of Pennsylvania. Um, anything else exciting other than my car troubles? Not really. Yeah, so my car is a 2000 Buick LeSabre, which I bought used with the help of my parents after I graduated from college in 2010. I have an hour to an hour and a half commute to Hartford, and then an hour, an hour and a half back, depending on traffic. Um, if things are going well, it's an hour. And I drive that five times a week to and from Hartford. And I've been slowly running this car into the ground. And it was pretty bad last year. It's been okay this year, but I think that's because it knew I was looking for a new car. And I had kind of slowed my search down and it gave me trouble this week. It's playing this fun game where it won't start. Um, mechanics thought it might be the fuel pressure regulator so which had been failing so we swapped that out and that wasn't a terrible expense but my starting problem still happening so they can't figure it out they can see no mechanical reason for it my dad thinks that it might be something to do with the um, ignition because my car will turn over once and then shut down and he was having the same problem with an old Saturn Ion of his a while back. Um, because the Ion ignition was having problems reading the chip and the key. 
So you'd go to start the car, it would it would turn over once, wouldn't start, and then you'd have to wait ten minutes for the sensor to reset, basically, is my understanding of how it went. So we're gonna see how it goes. Um, but I am looking for a new car in the coming weekends, not next weekend because we're going to the New York Renaissance Fair. That's a family thing that we do. My car will not be invited on that trip. And then a lot of car dealerships around here aren't open on Sundays. And I can't go during the week because of when work coordinates. And I don't want to deal with annoying, pushy people after a whole day of dealing with annoying, pushy people. So the next Saturday I have free. I'm gonna go start test driving stuff. See what I like. What is this bit of hair doing? I don't know. It's humid. It doesn't know what to do. So those are really the big events that have happened in my life since I last podcasted. I go to work. I come back. I craft. Well, my parents went on vacation this past week, which was interesting. Of course, that's when my car decides to start having problems when my parents go on vacation. But, um... But I suppose that will bring me to the reason why this podcast episode is so late. Because the day I'm filming this is Sunday, August... whatever. 16th? Is it the 16th today? I don't know. Um... And normally I film on Friday nights or Saturdays. So I have the whole weekend to do all the processing stuff. And I know I posted my last episode, was it Tuesday? Um, so this will probably go up Wednesday or Thursday. Not that you care at the time that I'm filming this. It will already be up by the time you hear this. But um, because my parents were on vacation, I took Friday off because usually that's a day that my mom doesn't have any work, so she's with the dog all day. I mean, my brothers are home. One brother is home from college, and the other one is, um, he starts a job this week. He's graduated, but he's starting a new job this week. Um, but, I mean, she's used to mom and dad, and occasionally me. Because they were both in school for a big chunk of her living here um because mom got it for christmas so they were off for the winter break but you know they went back to school and she got used to it being the three of us you know this so i was very attached to my mom um so they were on vacation and she was depressed and whiny and timing is wonderful she went into heat this week so she was you know puppy cramps and whining and favorite people aren't here and it was just a mess and I knew it was gonna be even without her going into heat she was gonna not be pleased about everything so I took Friday off so I could spend the day with the dog well my sister had this week off too because where she works closes for a week in August and um, she invited me down to play with uh, fiber dyeing because I had bought that um, undyed fiber from the No Makers fiber sale. And she bought some of that undyed fiber from that No Makers fiber sale. And she had bought some undyed yarn and dye kit stuff um, to play with. So I thought, bring the dog down to my sister's place. We'll play with yarn all day. The dogs will play with each other all day. It'll be wonderful. And that's why this podcast <laughs> is later than what I typically do is because of our dye experiment. Um, I should also note that you can follow my sister as Gabigales uh, on Instagram primarily. Um, and she has a blog called Once Upon a Corgi where she had, um, she had been providing updates on the corgi puppies when Audrey had puppies back in last October of which Penny is one. Um, but she's playing around with sewing project bags and dyeing some yarn, and uh, I don't know if she's 
really kind of... I mean, she said she's going to put up an Etsy shop, but she's playing around with it right now. Um, and I don't think she has that yet. But, yeah, so we went down there and we played with some dye. So we got down there and we started doing vinegar water soaks on our fiber. She had already pre-soaked a bunch of yarn bases. Well, she had bought like 10 merino nylon fingering weight skeins. Um, and she had pre-soaked those previously, so they were ready to go. So while we were soaking our fiber, we were dyeing some yarn. And I had so much fun after the first one that I asked her if I could just buy three skeins, because that seemed, well, I had a 20 in my wallet, so she had 20 pretty much covered three skeins um, on her, from where she bought them from. So I gave her a 20 and I dyed 300 gram fingering weight skeins, which I think was 463 yards. I think that's what she said. Um, yep. And I did kind of three techniques and that I got halfway through my explanation. That's why this podcast is so late because we were, we did all the soaking and we did all the dyeing on Friday, but not everything dried before I had to go home and bring Penny home. So some of it did and I brought it home with me and I started doing a citric acid um, bath on them just to finalize and set the colors. And uh, she brought up the rest yesterday and we were, doing the citric acid dyes and drying them all day. <laughs> because the, I mean, the, my yarn went quickly because um, all of her yarn stayed with her, but she brought the fiber up so that we could put it out on the clothesline out here um, because the air circulation was better and there's direct sunlight on our clothesline. So we first started dyeing yarn. Um, we each dyed two, and then we started fiber dyeing, and then we dyed some more yarn. But I'm gonna show you the yarn all at once, um, because that's just how my notes are organized. So this was the first one I did. Oh, I got weird shadows here. Um, it's a speckly, speckly yarn. Um, Mostly just because speckly yarn is really cool, and technically I'm not allowed to buy yarn, even though I bought this. Um, but also it's really hard to find... It was really hard for me to find speckly yarn that I liked that was in stock. A lot of the speckly yarn that I find, I found was pink, which is not really my colors. <laughs> so. I decided to just do some, some speckles. I did some orange, some bright blue, well the orange was called pumpkin, so I did some pumpkin, some bright blue, some pansy purple, and some twilight, which was a darker grayish stormy blue. Um, like here's a, there's some twilight, and there's some pansy purple. I don't know how well that's gonna come out as different colors on the screen, but but that was my first one. And then I did a second hand painting, and this one's very saturated. It has um, a red that's called Turkey Red, although I may accidentally call it Turkey Blood at some point <laughs> in the podcast because we kept calling it Turkey Blood because it looked like blood when it was all mixed up. Some turkey red, some pumpkin, and uh, the pansy purple. And for this one, this was hand painted. Um, I arranged it in like a, a square, and I did the red in each of the corners, and then the orange on either side of the red, and then the purple on the, the sides of the square. So I did reskein all of these because after dyeing and 
citric acid and drying and all that, the, they were really kind of ratty looking because they had gotten pulled all over the place. So I reskinned them. Um, and I really like how this color combination turned out. You could see where I didn't quite get, in some places I didn't quite get the dye all the way through the yarn, but I think that'll look fine. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. The speckle yarn will probably be socks, but I don't know if this will also be socks. Probably, knowing me. And then we dyed a bunch of fiber, and I'll show you the fiber in a minute. And then it was getting really late, and I needed to dye... Oh, I'm not in focus. There we go. Okay. And it was getting really late, and I had one more skein to dye, and I was... I was ready to go home, the dogs were ready to be separated, everybody was tired. So I took a skein, and this is, this is what it ended up with. This is the finished product. Um, it's just kind of a tonal green. I had dyed, um, I had taken the pot, it had a little bit of twilight left uh, in the water, just a smidge, 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 smidge. Um, so I poured some yellow dye in there, and it was really diluted yellow dye. It's very soft yellow, so it turned to kind of really soft green. I think it was Buttercup, I think that's the name of the dye for the yellow. And um, so the whole thing turned kind of a soft green. I pulled it out, I tied two or three knots in it, put it back in, I dumped a little bit of the bright blue in there just to make it a little bit green again. And then once it took that, I dye, or I poured some spring green in there, which is kind of a bluish green. And it was really diluted, so it, it's not very saturated at all, but I think it's a, it's a nice tonal green. And I think I'm going to do the verdure shawl in this color. Because I didn't have anything in my stash that would really fit uh, that pattern. Now the fiber, dyeing the fiber was an adventure. After we took it out of the vinegar soak, we put it outside to dry up a bit. We didn't wait for it to dry completely. Um, and I only did the three fiber, the three white fibers I got from, um, from No Makers. So there was a superwash merino, merino silk, a superwash merino bamboo nylon and a Falkland. Um, and the Falkland, which my sister had also got, and she was dyeing her Masham, Masham, M A S H A M, I didn't look up how to pronounce it. Um, my sister had dyed that too, and those two were the only types of fiber we had that wasn't superwash, I think. So, it absorbed the water really quickly, and then when we took it out, it dried really quickly. The superwashes and the blends, I, d I don't know what was because it was superwash and what was because it was a blend, um, but it took a while to absorb the water and then it wouldn't let it go. It, it would just stay heavy with water and it didn't want to dry. Um, so that was fun. Also, the um, Superwash Merino Bamboo Nylon was sticky. It stuck to gloves, it stuck to my skin, it stuck to towel that we put it on out on her deck. It, st <laughs> it w stuck to itself. It was a sticky fiber. It was difficult to manage the fiber when it was wet. Um, So the first fiber I decided to play with was the Superwash Merino Silk, which I decided to try to do hand painting. So my sister had a book that we were referencing, and they said you could hand paint fiber, so I wanted to try doing that. My sister tried doing that too. And that was really difficult. The fiber wanted to stick to what we were using, um, she had tried it first with a foam brush, it would stick to it, and she was like, nope, nope. And then we tried just, like, paint brushes. Stuck to it less, 
as long as you didn't really rush, as long as you kind of dabbed, it was fine. Um, but the color would stay at the top of the fiber and not really go in unless you like squished it. And like the fear of doing things with fiber is accidentally felting it. So you don't really want to agitate it too much. So what I ended up doing was taking the dye, pouring it into spots, and then just kind of smooshing it into the fiber with my hands. Which actually worked out pretty well in the end, but it just seemed like it was a terrible idea <laughs> when I was doing it. Um, but it actually turned out okay. So my plan for that one was yellow, the buttercup yellow, the pumpkin orange, and some pine green, which was this really kind of yellowy, bright green. And this is the fiber I dyed with that method. Um, you'll see it's the most saturated of all the dyed fiber that I have. Um, and it's probably the most dyed throughout. Um, you'll see in my other fiber, there are parts where the, the dye didn't take or there wasn't enough dye in the pot. Because after we each painted one fiber, we went, nope, no. We're going to immersion dye the rest of them because it was so much hassle in her tiny kitchen. And it took so much time that we were like, mm, no, we're not going to do that. So this is what, it looks more pumpkiny now than it did. The whole day we were calling it my carrot fiber, and I really enjoy it. I really do. I'm not sure if Superwash Merino Merino Silk would be good for socks, but I really want to spin this into a pair of Halloween socks with black contrasting heels and toes. I think that would be kind of amazing. The second fiber I dyed was the um, Superwash Merino Bamboo Nylon, which was so sticky to work with. So because it was so sticky, we decided there's no way I'm, we're going to hand paint this. So we did some immersion dyeing, and here's the end product. You can see it's not really saturated. Um, I think it's pinker in real life than it is on the screen there. There's some parts where it got pretty saturated, like there, but it took the dye really interesting. But it was also our first immersion dye, so we were still playing with it. Um, so we put it in a pot on simmer, and I poured some turkey red dye in there. Um, it was diluted, which is why it looks pink. So did that, and then I kind of coiled it into these loose knots that I was like, please don't felt because pulling you apart would be terrible. And we put some bright blue in there, and then I just kind of rolled it all into a ball and poured a bunch of pansy in there and just simmered it until the water ran clear every time. This braid has it doubled up, but you can see here the singles. This fluffed up to, to twice the original um, fiber thickness. Like this was a very thin fiber when it just came in the bag and it got so fluffy out on the clothesline. I mean, it really got the wind and the sun first thing in the morning. It is so fluffy. Fluffy, fluffy, fluffy. It's kind of ridiculous, and I kind of love it. Um, I don't know what this will be, but I'm excited to spin it because I've never spun this particular blend of fibers before. Um, and we'll see what I want to do with it once I spin it. And then the last one is my Falkland, which I knew I wanted to do 
just kind of one color. Well, it didn't end up as one color, but I tried. <laughs> Here's the Falkland. I couldn't double it up to do the braid. It was too fat. Um, there was still some purple dye. The purple dye tended not to be absorbed all the way through. Um, because it would be, the water would have the same amount of purple in it, uh, like over the course of 15 minutes. So we just kind of kept leaving a little bit of purple in there. Um, and then I added the Twilight. Um, and the Falkland, where the dye was poured in, it absorbed the dye really well like you can see. And I tried to pour it in in different places. But, uh... But it didn't really spread out in the water. It, the, the, the fiber absorbed it so quickly that, um... that it didn't really get a chance to get stirred in. Also, this wool is so ginormously fluffy. fluffy that I kept having to add water, like almost to the top of the pot that my sister had for dyeing things in, uh, <laughs> before it could be covered. But there were still parts in the middle that were up, so I had to like carefully like flip it over in the pot. Um, but I'm pretty pleased with how this dyed up, and uh, this will be really nice to, to spin. So that was all the fiber and yarn that I dyed. My sister also did a bit of onion skin dyeing, um, kind of just before we went on a lunch break, and she gave me one of the mini skeins from that pot of dye, which was nice of her. So that's why this podcast is late, um, it's because I was playing with dye. That will not be a regular thing. Um, because I can't really take over the kitchen here to do any of it regularly uh, if I had wanted to uh, because there are many people who live here and you kind of everybody kind of needs to eat um, we could do it at my sister's house because it's just her and her boyfriend and her boyfriend was working uh, but she doesn't have space to do it during cold weather so it's just kind of a summer hobby playing with dye at this point so now we can go into my regular segments, starting with stuff on sticks. I have three finished objects, and they are all socks. First thing I finished were my Flying North socks, uh, which are by Maria Monska of the Stitch in Sweden podcast. I used Sensations Truly, um, which is 55% wool, 30% nylon, and 15% rayon from bamboo in turquoise. I used US 1 2.25 millimeter uh, DPNs. And I did this using the Fish Lips Kiss heel. Um, it's a little longer than it should be, so that wasn't entirely accurate for my foot because um, I followed all the things, I did the cutout, and the foot is a little long for my foot. Um, but here's sock. And I'm not sure about this toe. Um, I do want to make a modified version of these socks again as my Hawkeye socks, socks, which I talked about last episode. Um, I think I'd go wider just because it didn't block out as round. When I Kitchener toes, which is about the same amount of stitches, it usually blocks out round um, from my foot. Or, you know, wash it out round, whatever. Um, but I think because it's so structured, because it's, it's a very structured cast on toe, that because it is, it's not gonna round out. Which is kind of weirdly pointy for my foot. Um, I have an idea to try and do the fish lips kiss heel as a toe. 
I have a theory on how I might be able to pull that off. Because that would work well for a toe for me. But we'll see how that goes. I will play. But overall, I'm pretty pleased with how these socks turned out. Um, I did these for the Opposites Along for the Yonder Woman podcast and for the Sock Knit Along for the Yarnaceuticals podcast, I believe. I think these are the socks I entered for that. I was working on a lot of socks all at the same time. But, uh, those are finished, so that's good. And then I finished a pair of basic vanilla socks that I kept in my bag for work using Loops and Threads Luxury Sock, which is 60% merino, 30% nylon, 10% cashmere in the canyon colorway. Again, on US 1, 2.25 double pointed needles. And I use the aluminum needles um, from Boy that you buy at Joann's. Um, so here's sock on a blocker and this one was done using 64 stitches which is slightly like it's a comfortable for my foot but it's slightly looser than I generally prefer but um, if worse comes to worse I can use them as layering socks in the winter but I do like how these turned out and I did the fish lips kiss heel on these too um, which actually worked out well for this stripe and yarn. Um, I think I hit it at just the right point to get the heels more or less identical. These are the socks that I also knit to in tandem with each other. So and I tried to get them to start at exactly the same point. It's not exactly the same point, but it's pretty close. Like I have yellow in the cast on here but only like one little bit here. But it's a pretty close match and I'm pretty pleased that, that worked out. Um, then I finished a pair of hand spun socks for uh, the Yarngasm podcast spin along, knit along, sock along thing. Um, I haven't posted them up there as of recording this yet, uh, but I spun this, here are my finished socks. Talk with the socks on the screen. Uh, I, f I spun this um, using Frabjus Fibers fiber. Uh, it was a BFL in the Dunedin colorway. I played yarn chicken with these socks. Um, I thought about spinning extra for heels and toes. I should have done at least for the heel because I was 10 yards maybe short I had to s I skipped a bunch of the plain knit rows in the sock decreases and I kitchenered them at uh, quite a few stitches it's a very flat toe uh, and in pro I'm probably in a commercial yarn this would not fit my foot they're almost an inch shorter than my other socks, but this is heavier than a fingering weight. Um, so it actually stretches more than a fingering weight sock. So my foot's a little bit bigger than this blocker, but it quite easily accommodates a little extra room in the sock. I wore them around for a while. They're really cushy because I was knitting them at the same, more or less the same gauge. I mean, I was using US 1 2.25 DPNs, basic vanilla sock, pretty sure I cast on 56 the way I normally do. Um, I mean, the fabric came out a little bigger, so it's closer to um, this size sock. But there is a lot of stretch in my chain ply yarn. So, these will work out nicely for me. 
I just did a normal reinforced heel flap, a slip stitch heel flap. I came so close to doing exactly my vanilla sock. So close. So now I know when I'm doing hand spun socks, do at least a contrasting heel. Um, until I can reliably spin a fingering weight. Because I think if this had been a true fingering weight, I would not have run out. But I, w I was working two ends of the same ball at the end of it, and I had maybe this much yarn left between the socks when I got to the point where I was going to catch it. I, I had just had yarn enough to Kitchener the toes. It was, I was knitting one row on one sock, one row on one sock, one row on one sock, one row on one sock. It was real close. But I made it and I'm pleased. And I can submit these for the spin along knit along. I do have a couple of finished objects. Let me just scroll in my notes here. Not finished objects. Works in progress. I showed you my finished objects. Works in progress. Say the words that you mean to say. Um, yes. So I have my cozy memories blanket, which is in progress. I did put a few more squares on it since the last episode. Here we go. So, let me see, where was I last time? Okay, I had started, the weight is making them rectangular. This one, last time, also I think I just knit rectangularly. I had started this one, um, and I finished that one up. I added this one. This one, this green one, and this brown one, and I started on this one. And these are all from Diane of the Peggy May podcast, because we did a swap and she also included some in a prize that I won for her May along, which was very nice. And I try to use up yarns that I've gotten from people. I've only gotten them from two or three, three people. But I try to use them up all at once so I remember whose they are to say on the podcast. Oh, I forgot about this one. And I put this one on there. I forgot. Because I had finished this squared off row and then I put the green one on here and this one on here because those are the ones that require cast-ons. So I just did those real quick. This one I didn't have quite enough of to finish. I started, I added in a little bit left over from one of the ones I got from Kristen from the Yongasm podcast up there at the top. But I think it, it matches pretty well. Well enough for a blanket that's not going to match itself, so <laughs> that works out. I also have that lace triangle shawl um, in my Star Wars comics bag from Tangerine Designs. Whoops. Just kick my tripod. This is out of the Plymouth Yarn Revel, which is 80% alpaca and 15% merino. Um, it's a single ply. It's in the grape mist colorway. I'm using US 5 3.75 millimeter aluminum circulars. And this had started out as a modular kerchief, but I decided to just keep going with the basic triangle part. 
And I haven't really put too much on this since last time I showed it to you. I got through the dark, dark purple and I'm in the blue again. But, um, it's been warm and this yarn sticks to me when it's warm. Um, I'm using these little ring stitch markers I got from Ellie Knitter in a mini swell. But yeah, I haven't really put too much knitting in on this. Because socks just go by so much quicker than shawls do. I do have more finished objects. I got to put them in my notes. Because it only took a couple hours. I have little tiny scrap sweaters to add to my ornaments box. It's the mini sweaters pattern. It might say mini sweaters with cables. I don't remember who it's by. I don't remember what needle size I used off the top of my head because I forgot to put them in my notes. I brought them over here and I didn't put them in my notes. I don't know what happened, but here, here they are. I only noticed them because I knocked them over. They're tiny little sweaters on these tiny little hangers. I have a tiny little blue sweater um, that also has a hanger because it was a package of three hangers. I had made this one. It's Merry Little Lamb Wool, and this is leftover from the canyon. Just little raglan sweaters to put on a Christmas tree. I'm also working on a shawl for the... Little Bobbin's Purposeful Stash Along, because apparently I am a sucker for knit alongs. It's in my Space Ray Guns bag uh, by Tangerine Designs, and it is the Del Norte shawl by Daniel Morgan. Um, I've started it in some Ella Ray Lace Merino, which is a 100% extra fine merino in green, under the number 11. It's not a lace weight though, it's a fingering weight. Um, but it's called lace, I don't know why. And it's a triangular shawl. Uh, it's a pretty simple, oh, you can see right through it. It's a pretty simple triangular shawl. Um, the patterning is done using different sections of stockinette and garter stitch. So, we've got a triangle of stockinette at the top, and then there's a triangle of stockinette in between these garter stitches at the bottom. And then I believe it'll finish up with um, a few garter rows and some stripes. And I have another yarn in here to do with the stripes. And it is a Barocco Cosmo. Cosma, Cosma, um, in this blue, I don't, color 2442, um, which is 60% baby alpaca, 30% wool, and 10% silk. Um, I had bought this blue to specifically go with this green. And that's why it's part of my stash along, because it's been in my stash together for a shawl project for a while. This is actually a, a little bit of a heavier weight than the green, but it'll be at the end of the shawl in a garter stripe, so I don't think that'll make much of a difference. Um, and I have on here all these test stitch markers I did for... Um, For my shop, I knew I wanted to have Star Trek stitch markers, but I didn't quite know how to, what would be the best way to have the different colors. So those are test ones. All my test ones that aren't completely botched, I keep, because I might as well use them. And I'm also working on gift knitting. I've already started gift knitting for Christmas. 
I'm not going to show things that I'm knitting as gifts um, on the podcast because I'm not sure who watches and who doesn't. Um, usually, in years past, I've done a kind of Christmas gifts roundup blog post over at my blog um, after New Year's. Pretty much once I have all the gifts sent out to everybody I'm sending gifts to. Um, you might see pieces of gifts that I'm making over at Instagram um, because I do like posting vague pictures of knitting on Instagram. Um, but that'll probably be it for some of that knitting. until I get all those gifts out. Because I want to be prepared and not be rushed into crafting things at Christmas, like have been for the past few years, which really, really sucked a lot. And I don't have any more notes, but I think that's it. I think that's all I'm working on. So we'll move on to the next segment. The next segment, a couple hours later, because my camera battery died, is stuff on hooks. I'm still just working on the two projects crocheting. The Granny Square Odds and Ends, I uh, haven't done anything with. But I have been working on my Weekender Blanket, the um, pattern Weekender Blanket by Sandra Paul using a variety of Lion Brand Woolies and Vanna's Choice yarns. Here it is. This is probably the same view you got last time, but I did add a few more. I think these two rows will be the last ones because this will go across across, 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 and then down all the way to the bottom. And then I think I'll start adding borders um, after I fill in all the half hexagons and the little partial arrow shaped ones, these little guys. This is being crocheted on a USI 5.5 millimeter hook, but not much other progress for crochet. So we'll move on to stuff on spindles and wheels. I have one finished hand spun project. Now I meant to get it out of the plastic before I showed it on the podcast. This was the Phoenix Fiber Club Rolags for May. I just spun each of the Rolags to show one up close. I spun these on my Raw Elm drop spindle from Sunny Fairy on Etsy, uh, and I Andean plied them, which I meant to bring over something to show you. Do I have scrap yarn in here still? No, I have this. Okay. Glass of water. Almost knocked it over. Basically, Andean plying is a way of wrapping fiber around your hand to do a two ply with one single strand of yarn. So pretend this, or one single uh, spun. So pretend this is my hand spun. You would wrap it up and around your middle finger. This is terrible. This is a terrible view. So you wrap it up and around your middle finger then down and around your hand, and then up and around your middle finger again, over and over. So you add something like that, but with more fiber. And then you kind of scrunch it up, get your finger out from under there, and then put the whole thing back on your wrist. And then you have two ends, and you can ply them together off your wrist. 
And if you do it right, it comes off fairly easily. Uh, <laughs> sometimes that fiber was sticking to me into each other, so there was a little bit of a struggle for me, but for the most part, it's a nice way to get a two-ply out of a little bit of hand spun. Like, I wouldn't do it off of a spool that came off of a spinning wheel, but like this much is manageable on your hand. And it also evens out my um, drop spindling singles because, you know, when you start, it's the, the spindle is lighter because there's nothing on it. But as you spin, it gets heavier and heavier and my singles tend to get a little bit thicker as they go. But if I two-ply it that way, it evens it out because you've got the thickest end and the thinnest end being plied together evenly to make an average um, an average weight of the yarn. Um, and this is super sparkly, as you can see. These little sparkly things have been flying all over the house. Um, this ended up being 17 wraps per inch at a light sport weight. Um, it's 45 and a half grams, about 178 yards, which isn't that bad out of four little roll legs. Uh, that's the only finished spinning I have currently. I do have an update on my giant ball of wool hand spun on the wheel that's been a work in progress since forever. I finished one half of the fiber. One half was divided into two for long color repeats and the other half was divided into a whole bunch of little nests for short color repeats to do fractal plying. Well, I have finished the short color repeats half. And there's my bobbins. And I am really pleased with how they look right now. Um, I'm probably going to spin something else really quick on the wheel on my Ashford Kiwi 2 before I start into the other half of that fiber just because Spinning that much fiber can be really tedious. <laughs> it really can. I don't know, but I think I will spin something in between so that I don't drive myself crazy just spinning this until the end of time. So my next segment is stuff with thread. This is the sewing portion. Uh, I have one finished object. I made a new pair of pants for the Renaissance Fair. They're this green. And they're just a simple elastic waisted long pant. It's like pajama. I used a pajama pants pattern from Craftsy. There was a free PDF download wide pajama pants pattern. So it's really wrinkly, but whatever. Because I don't really care about wrinkles when I'm going to the rent fair because you end up disheveled and sweaty anyway. Um, it had me doing reinforced seams since I don't have a serger, so a regular seam and then zigzag stitch to reinforce it. And it was pretty simple. It was not unlike the pajama shorts that I had made, but I did ensure a tag in the back because I couldn't, at a quick glance, it's hard to tell what's the back and what's the front on pajama pants. On my pajama shorts, I don't care because they're pajamas, but these are actually going to be, well, I did wear them in public, so I want to make sure I've got the back in the back and the front in the front. Um, that's the only finished object I have. Toss it over there. I have not done any work on that quilt top from the bento bag scraps because it's been hot and all my sewing stuff is upstairs and I don't want to bring it downstairs. 
and my Christmas cross stitch is not finished but I have made some progress I'm getting up to the second corner I had done this corner down here uh, I can't see it it's under there and I gone up and I'm working on this corner so the end is in sight for this um, slowly but surely on this as well so we're gonna move on to new stuff there's a surprisingly large amount of new stuff I wasn't intending to get this much new stuff but there was a coupon that worked out well for getting a bunch of stuff that I knew I needed to get soon anyway but the first things I got were a couple of Kickstarter rewards. The Spun Fiber Company had a Kickstarter and they sent me the reward for the level I backed. So the Spun Fiber Company. This is Well Fleet, a 100% local merino. It's a sport weight, 50 grams, 175 yards. this tonal gray and they also sent a little lavender thingy with it so it's been hanging out in the yarn chicken tote with all my finished objects and things for the podcast um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this yet but It's not super, super soft, but it's, it's airy, so I don't know. It, it'll probably be a hat or something. It's kind of squishy. I like that. And Knit Circus also had a Kickstarter, uh, and this was the reward for that Kickstarter. Um, it's the Greatest of Ease base, 80% uh, superwash merino, 20% nylon, 400 yards, 3.5 ounces, 100 grams, in Grand Canyon, which is this red. And I don't know what I'm going to make with this either, but it's a very nice yarn, it's very soft. I also bought a couple of new drop spindles because I can't help myself, but they're different drop spindles than the ones I already have. I have like five top whirl drop spindles, so I bought a bottom whirl drop spindle with this Celtic knot design and a little Turkish spindle. These are from Turtle Made on Etsy, and they are 3D printed. They're also interchangeable, because I can take that apart. Of course, Turkish spindles come apart anyway. And I can put this on this one, have a teller Turkish spindle, or a tiny little bottom whirl spindle. And that's pretty cool. I don't know which one I'm gonna spin with first, but I thought it'd be really cool to try them out. And they were pretty cheap. Um, I don't remember how much I paid for them, but they're around the same price or less than the just plain starter wooden ones you can get for bottom whirl spindles and I was having a hard time finding Turkish spindles that were below $30 so even though it's teeny tiny um, I can swap out the shaft on this one or I can just spin it teeny tiny see how that goes um, 
But I'm excited to try them because I've never spun with either type of spindle before. That'll be really interesting. And I bought Christmas gift yarn, which is what I had a coupon for. It was a free shipping coupon. I bought the yarns from joannes.com. I prefer to buy gift yarn from big box stores because those yarns tend to be easy to care for, which is good when you're giving gifts because not everybody is uh, well versed in wool care. Lots of stuff that people can throw in the wash and dryer and it's not bad yarn. It's really not. Um, there are few yarns in the big box stores that bother me. Um, I mean, I love sock yarn from the big box stores because you know what it'll do. And they have a lot of great blends that aren't scratchy or anything. So I'll just quickly go through some of the yarns that I bought for gifts. I bought this Premier Yarns, Deborah Norville, um, Serenity Sock Weight, in Picasso Marble, and I bought a Deborah Norville Serenity Sock Yarn in Charcoal. I bought some Red Heart, Heart and Soul with Aloe in Blackjack. I bought some Patton's Croy socks in Mul Mulberry Stripes. I bought some Lion Brand Sock Ease in cotton candy. I haven't used the uh, the sock ease before so I'm interested to see what that will be like washed because it is a little rough in this game but I will find out. And I bought some more Lion Brand sock ease in rock candy. Which is a lot all at once, but I got free shipping, and I love going to the store, to Joann's. I really do. But I know that they had more colors online, and I didn't want to just buy what was there as opposed to buying what I thought people would like. So. I made an order, free shipping, that was worth it. Yep. So now I'm almost set with Christmas gift yarn. I have some more yarns I need to look at, but I'm a lot more prepared now than I was last year or the year before. So then, stuff for Etsy. I am going to be putting these up on my Etsy shop um, all together as a mini skein pack. Because um, you could probably make something with this amount of yardage that would be really interesting. Or use it with another yarn as like, I don't know focal yarn or something um, and I don't know what to do with it so I figure I'll put it up in the shop if anybody wants it it'll be up there uh, I meant to do more but then the situation with my car kind of killed a couple of evenings where 
I wanted to work on more stitch markers, but we'll see what happens. Um, but I have ordered new business cards. My old business cards were ones that I had for a long time. I got them for free in college, and they weren't quite well designed. But I have ordered more business cards, which are really simple. Um, they just, I'll show you them when I get them in, but it's the Freakish Lemon, and then freakishlemon.com, freakishlemon.etsy.com, and that's it, because that's all you really need to know. And I like having business cards with a lot of space on them, because if I need to write something down for somebody, I can just give them a business card with a note on it. Or, like, if I'm giving a promo code for something, I can just write it on the back and give it to you. So, nice, simple, two most important places. Because FreakishLemon.com will get you everywhere. Um, but they haven't come in. I am excited to see them. Uh, because it's been a long time since I've played with business cards. And it's really it for the shop at this point. Other stuff. Stuff I am watching. I've rewatched all of the Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries episodes that are on Netflix. I am rewatching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I haven't really watched any movies since. It's mostly been podcasts. It's just an endless stream of podcasts. Uh, stuff I'm reading, I'm still reading Planet of Exile by Ursula K. Le Guin. I don't know. I'm having an off year with books. It's really bad. I just need to sit down and finish it. Maybe I'll do that while I'm uploading all this footage to my computer. I mean, I'm reading plenty of fan fiction. I am never not reading fan fiction, but I've been really slow on books this year. Stuff I am playing, I'm still playing Lego Marvel Super Heroes because I'll be playing that for a long time. And I said I'd do updates on podcasts when I started listening to new ones. And I've subscribed to a new one, but I've only listened to one episode so far. Um, they were recently on Stuff Mom Never Told You, which is a podcast uh, put out by How Stuff Works. Um, I think th three of the hosts. I think there's four hosts. But it's a podcast called Black Girls Talking. And I've listened to one episode where they... We're talking about the movie, oh, what's it called? Magic Mike? Is that the movie? The one about the strippers? And it was an all right episode. I, I mean, I hadn't seen the movie and it's not really a movie that I would go to a theater to see. Um, Cause I'm, I have problems with comedies. I can't always sit through and watch a comedy, uh, especially if there is, and there usually is, because comedies often include embarrassment. I have a secondhand embarrassment problem. It makes my skin crawl and I have to get up and leave the room. So I don't really see comedies in theaters. I don't think I've even seen a preview for that movie, so I don't even know if that's one that I'll watch later on Netflix. But it was interesting to hear their thoughts and all that. Um, but I've only listened to the one episode, so we'll see if I keep it in my queue. Um, I feel like it could be really interesting and probably a good perspective for me to hear periodically. So I'll keep listening to it for a while, see if I really like it. I think that's it. I think that's all I've got to talk about on this podcast. 
I have no idea how long this podcast is because I spent so long talking about dying fiber and yarn at the beginning. Uh, show notes and links to everything can be found over at freakishlemon.com. Come join the Freakish Lemon video podcast group over at Ravelry. Uh, there's not a ton of participation in the threads at this point, but we're still a pretty small group, so come join and, you know, talk and stuff. That'll be fun. Um, you can follow me as Freakish Lemon on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Ravelry. Uh, and check out my shop over at freakishlemon.etsy.com. All the links to that will be in the down bar here on YouTube. And that's it. That's the episode. I will see you in September. Goodbye. Thank you.